This podcast is made possible by VersaPay. Hi, this is Brandon Maltash, CFO of Moloco, and you're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 893. What I want the FP&A team to do is to be able to educate the operational and commercial leaders of the business what, it, what, what a return on capital actually looks like, right? What it means if you sell something and cannibalize something else. I want that common language to go across the business and why that's so important as the business continues to scale. I want that to be a common vernacular that everyone in the company understands. Sometimes, even, even though we, we generate quite a bit of cash, of course, we're going to have to say no. And what, what I found is it's not good to be the, the wizard behind the curtain saying yes or no as things come. You need to explain to people why. This, these 10 things are a better return for the company and, and, and are, are better for our customers in their long-term health than these 10 things. And here are the metrics that help you understand that that's the case. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Greg Conti, CFO of Vera Mobility. Back in 2001, upon graduating from GE's financial management program, 20-something-year-old Fred Conti was quickly assigned to GE's corporate audit staff and subsequently dispatched overseas for a five-year tour of duty. It was during the first 12 months of Connie's year abroad that he received a job review from a manager who asked him to create a list of skills and experiences that he expected to accrue during his years abroad. Over time, Conti's list of items evolved from being mainly one of hard skills to becoming a chronicle of business insights that would ultimately reshape Conti's view of business. You'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. When your accounts receivable automation focuses only on back office tasks, you forget the most important stakeholder, your customers. VersaPay gives you all the tools you need to automate those tasks, plus the collaboration tools to take on everything that automation alone simply can't. This doesn't just increase efficiencies and accelerate cash flow, but also creates a dramatically improved experience for your customers. And as the economy tightens, can you really afford to risk losing customers over an invoice to cash process they find frustrating. With VersaPay, clients typically achieve 50% less time managing receivables, 25% faster payments, 30% fewer past due invoices, and 81% customer portal adoption. Learn more about VersaPay's collaborative AR ERP payments and cash application solutions at versapay.com slash CFO. Hello, we're speaking with Craig Conti, CFO of Vera Mobility. Craig, welcome. Hey, Jack. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, Craig, as always, we're going to ask you to look back to kick things off. We want to know a little bit about you and those experiences that you feel prepared you to become a CFO. What comes to mind? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, you know, I, so I grew up in upstate New York and um, I had a bunch of, I would say, kind of manual labor jobs growing up right up until I entered the corporate workforce. And I think, you know, that'll kind of come into play a little bit later. I talk about my career journey, but I draw off that experience quite a bit. Um, I started out in General Electric. I spent 15 years there. Um, GE was the ultimate kind of academy company. I went through their training program, and then I went on to their corporate odd staff. And I, I would say, if I think about the first 10 years of my career, 
that was probably the most defining experience. The, the way that worked, it's, it's loosely based on the external consultation model. So you've got kind of four months to come in, figure things out, learn the process, catch up to the owners, and then kind of get ahead of them with either an audit, if it's financial or operational, some improvements. And that taught me really quickly to assess risk fast. It taught me how to work and, and, and learn a process fast and try to, you know, kind of pick out what's important and what's not. I think the most defining thing, though, of that first, call it seven years of my career with GE is I spent a good chunk of it outside the United States. So growing up in upstate New York, um, I went to school and up, I went to college in upstate New York. So th there was some global influence, but not a ton. I found myself for about three of those six or seven years as the only American in the room. A lot of times the only native English speaker in the room, the only male in the room, you name it. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the developing world, places like Brazil and central Mexico, India, Eastern Europe. And I, I think what was defining about that is, you know, they, they talk about language it is kind of a barrier. But once you speak the language of business, that, that goes away pretty quickly. I learned that. The second thing I learned, it's something that I, I just, I will never, never forget. And I bring it with me kind of everywhere I go, is that when you go out, out of the developed world and into the developing world, there's a ton of talent that has just never had the opportunity to do the kind of roles that, that you've done. So I, I can't tell you how many times I ran into super talented people in the developing world who are just as talented as the folks I work with in the States, but didn't have that opportunity. And, and the reason why I think about that as you develop as a leader and as you develop your team, one of the things for my teams in the States, I always tell them, you know, you go back to the old college graduation, look to your left and look to your right. Those are the people you're competing with. I mean, that, that is not true. There are 15 people that you can't see. And that developing world is catching up very, very quickly. So I think as global leaders, that kind of set me up to say, when you're, when you're operating in the United States, you have to remember that as you go internationally, that talent resides in the places that you're going, not necessarily the place you're growing from. Can I ask you just uh, just regarding GE? Because you go overseas pretty quickly. And right. were you part of the audit team at that place in time? Or what were you attached to? I was. So I started off on the financial management program, which is a six month rotational program. I did that for two years, worked briefly in one of the businesses. And then I was on the, the corporate audit staff was what it was called at the time or the audit team um, for just over four years. And that, that really was the best experience that I had. You know, so I, it, it was interesting when I started that, Jack, you know, I, a really forward looking manager who was literally my own age, but a very forward looking person said, since this is your first review out here, what I want you to do is write down what you think you're going to get out of this experience, depending on how long you stay. I kept that list and all the hard skills I had written that I would hope after, after spending four years were definitely there, but the experience was a lot richer than that. And the list was a lot longer when I came out. And it was really that learning about how to operate globally, how to think globally and get away from that American kind of centric thinking. There are other ways to solve problems um, and you got to be open to those. And let me just ask, as a member of the audit team going overseas, are you where are you located? I mean, w w and, and because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you went to plants, you were looking at uh, some of the operational uh, facilities. So I'll, I'll just give you the very first example at the tender age of maybe 24 or 25 years old. Um, I was dropped into a, a power company that we bought from the Italian government in Florence, Italy. P Pignoni. Very, yes, Nuvo Pignoni. Exactly. Exactly. I was there for the, for, for the early days of the acquisition and uh, I owned inventory. So 24 hours after showing up, yes, I was in an office, but I was on the floor. Right. I was going through and watching how the blade assembly came onto the rotor and and what the service teams did when the, when a broken blade came in and how they diagnosed that, because you don't have a prayer of understanding that complex of a level of accounting without going out and physically seeing it. So that was one example. I have similar examples in Rio de Janeiro. They, they were a better. giant employer around the city of Florence. Now, if anybody had said, where was this company located? It's an Italian company. Woody would have said Milan, most likely. But yeah, no. Milan, Torino. No, th this one, and, and literally, I was just in Florence a few weeks ago um, on vacation, first time back in 20 years. And uh, it, it is maybe three or four miles outside the city center. It's close. And well, when you do come back, you join GE Capital. 
And GE Capital was a place where a lot of uh, finance talent got developed. Is that your story or? You know, it's not. It's uh, when, when you come off the corporate odd staff at that point in time with General Electric, you got this unique opportunity, which I think is unique in corporate America, as far as I'm aware, we kind of get to pick your job. Right. And um, I, I said, you know, I've spent almost 10 years or seven or eight years, I guess, at that point at the company. And I never saw the other half of what we do, which is I, I'd only been on the industrial side of the business. So I wanted to see the leverage lending part of the business. Um, the timing was less than opportune. I went in 2006 and I was there through the middle of 2008. So I, I, I certainly saw a whipsaw there. Um, but uh, it, it was great to go and see that. It, it, and I think it goes back to, you know, when you, it, there's a lot of books out now about GE and, and one, one of the common themes that runs through all of them was it was when, when the company kind of figured out early on how quote unquote easier it was to make money on money than it was to actually go invent and manufacture a product. It grew very fast. So I, 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 I kind of got to see that. But what was really interesting about being there for that nanosecond in history is you get to see the other side of what a lever business looks like when the funding market dries up. So I, I let, let, let me put it this way, Jack. I took I took the the business. I took the uh, the role to learn that side of the business. I got a much bigger lesson than I bargained for being there in 2008. Wow, I, I bet. And and uh, within GE also. And what's interesting too is you arrived just in the final months of Jack Welch, so you do straddle both <laughs> CEOs and, yes. and those realms. Very interesting. Um, I got to ask you about your your the leadership training along the way. I know GE has a great reputation for this. Can you speak to a little bit about um, some of the programs or, you know, did you take anything away from that? And I'm sure it was, it was part of the culture. Oh, en enormous. Right. And, and I think, I think the biggest piece is there um, how to make an impact quickly right now, to be, to be fair, later in my career, I had to, I had to moderate that a little bit, right? Because that was a very unique culture, very successful culture, but a unique culture. So I think it's how to make an impact quickly. And then I think the other thing that's really never left me is because of the scale and the complexity of the problems that you worked on in a company like that, you constantly had to boil it down to something that was easily understandable and actionable. And while that may sound like a non-value added part of the process, you do the hard work, then make it easy to understand. That's really the hardest thing to do. And that's a skill that I've brought with me, I think, to each successive uh, experience that I've had. And, and what I've realized is when you're at a leadership level and you have limited amount of time to make an impact, you really better understand the two or three things where you can have an impact, identify them quickly, and be able to set a clear vision around that. So I, I, don't, I, I think it was by grand design and General Electric figuring this out over 100 years, that was a really, really good training ground, I think. And then, of course, the hard skills. Right. So you, you get to see so many different businesses that operate at scale and the level of, of talent was through the roof. So um, th those were things I, I've taken away. And I always root for the company still to this day. And it was a great experience. When you do leave, you leave for another fairly sizable ITW. That's a, not a small enterprise either. It's, no. it's, uh, so what were you thinking? Because ultimately, we know you're in a much smaller company today, which is right. an interesting chapter to open after these large enterprise organizations that you were part of. And meanwhile, your first step out of GE has got to be huge. I mean, you 15 years behind you, you are a creature of that culture. <laughs> Less of a better way of expressing it. Yeah. No, I think that, that was a great way to express it. And, and I'm sure other folks have the same thing. You know, I, I would say that Amazon is kind of what GE was at that point in terms of you grow up there, very unique culture. Then you go out and you have to say things are done a little different here. And and, and here here's, here's how I would... Well, let me answer your direct. Why did I take the role? It was it was the opportunity at the time GE was getting a little more segmented. Things were um, going back office was being consolidated. And what it, my perception was the operational CFO job. It was a little bit more disconnected from the customer than it had been in the past because of some of the structural changes because of cost, good reasons that were being made in the company. What ITW had at the time it was the CFO job of, of a welding business, classic duopoly with a, a, a publicly traded uh, competitor, unbelievable business, engineering heavy, and it was a true operational CFO job, kind of the whole thing, right? Um, all the way to uh, accounts payable, and, and that's really what I wanted to do. So that was why the move. 
Well, let, let me tell you, Jack, what, what really hit me between the eyes, I would say, in the first 30 days was that the way to solve problems between the two organizations were so different. It'd be hard for me to find the right adjective to cite, but both very successful. So GE was about making an impact quick. Maybe you do 10 things and three of them go really, really well. And the other seven kind of peter out over time. And at scale, that's how you move forward. At ITW, the pace of change was much, much slower, but much more deliberate. You take those 10 things, weed out the seven that aren't going to work, get to those three, and you drive them until they are done. And I think looking at those two approaches, I've stolen things from each of those experiences um, being in the, uh, the, the public CFO chair today. So I wouldn't change that experience for the world. That was great. And at, at uh, ITW, really a FP&A professional. You are sort of a lead top executive in the FP&A function. Right. Uh, when do you start thinking the CFO path? When do you start saying, you know, how do I step into that role? Where do I find it? Yeah, I, I think I think I was there my first six months out of college. I, I always knew that's what I was aspiring to. And, you know, the, the nice part about being at GE and ITW is you get to interact with those people. Um, and I, I, I emulated people who did the role. I, and here, here's why. I, I thought they when I saw really good CFOs and I've seen a lot, um, I think they were a really good blend between technical skills and operational chops. Right. And you have to be able to do both. So I, I very deliberately throughout my career made sure that I, uh, I, I, I kind of stacked up those experiences. Now, the one thing that's tough, if you are in a, uh, a, a matrix organization, big publicly traded company, is you really don't see some sides of the business. It's really hard to get a detailed view of tax. You'll see pieces of it, but it's hard to see the whole thing or treasury. Right. You may do a role in Treasury. I audited Treasury a couple of times on the audit staff, but you've never structured a deal. Right. So there's always going to be those gaps. And I think the trick the trick for me and, and I, I would guess for others is to say when you're ready to make that jump, you need to know that those gaps are there and make sure that you address them. But you really need to fill out that technical FP&A and accounting skill set and that operational skill set. That's the base. The others you, you can build on with time. All right. Well, when you do uh, step into a CFO role, uh, it's a it, is it a two billion dollar company? It's it's Century Aluminum produces aluminum in the United States and Iceland. Again, not a small company, really. How did you know? Here's the way to enter the CFO office. Sure. I, and, and I looked at it as most CFOs do were relatively risk averse people. I would say you've seen more than I have, I'm sure. But I, I, I tend to think that. So it, it was a it was a, a commodity business. Right. So um, that has its own set of challenges to it. But, it. but the CEO was the former CFO. Right. So there there was a really good kind of, hey, if I ever got to something I didn't know, I'd have the ability to ask that. And that also comes with it, its own unique challenges. Um, but I thought it was it was the right time. And I think culturally what the, what the organization needed at the time was a financial leader who could, who could connect operations to Wall Street, not just a Wall Street financial leader. And, and I really fit that bill. Um, I did that role for about four years and it, it was amazing when, when you're in the commodity space. And I happen to be in the aluminum space, but you could insert commodity here. I think this 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 applies. You'll have. A great year and then four really bad years. And what's extremely interesting is how you're how you're communicating with debt and equity investors in your third year of losses and explaining that that next year is on the horizon. And that that's something that was very difficult. Um, I loved it. I love the challenge. I got a lot of help doing it. And again, those are th those are some stressful moments, though. That uh, you know, what, what, what do they say? The the hottest uh, the hottest fire forges the strongest steel. In this case, aluminum. So I I, uh, I really enjoyed that, and I will take that. So when when you look at a company like the one I'm in today that generates a ton of cash, the the question is how do you spend that cash versus a commodity business, which is how do you make sure you have that cash? So seeing both sides of that equation has been really really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And well, your career is really interesting. I mean, from GE to GE Capital to ITW to uh, uh, Century Aluminum and now to uh, Vera Mobility, which is also an interesting company. Uh, let's let's have you explain to us what this company is about. What does it do and, and what are its offerings? 
Yeah. So th th thanks for asking it that way, because the, the first thing you have to say is what is Avera Mobility and what does it do? So Avera Mobility is we're the global leader in uh, smart mobility technology that makes transportation uh, smarter, safer and more connected. Right. I'll give you just a, a top of the waves financially and then I'll go into we have three businesses very briefly. And I think it'll make sense as to what we do. So we're about a three quarter of a billion company, just uh, top line, just shy of that in 2022. We've grown nine percent organically um, on, a, on a Kager basis since 2019, 46 percent margins, 50 percent free cash flow conversion. So very different challenge for me personally that I've seen in the past. This is about effective capital allocation and a growing profitable business that generates a lot of cash. So we've got um, about 1,600 employees globally and 2,400 customers. So let me talk to you about, about actually what we do. So we're, we're number one in the three markets that we serve today. The first is we're the number one provider uh, globally of tolling and violation management for rental cars and corporate fleets. So to, to kind of give you an idea, this business is a $325 million business, very profitable, mid 60% margin, high single digit organic growth out for the next five years. And to give you a context of scale, we process about 220 million tolls per year Just to give you an idea of, uh, of the scale here. Um, we process about 1.4 million violations and we register about a million title and register about a million and a half vehicles. So if you see a corporate fleet out there, um, if you have a rental car in, um, in, in the United States of America and some parts of, of, uh, of Europe, there's a very, very, very good chance that Vera Mobility has been part of your journey. The other piece is we're the number one provider of uh, road safety cameras in the world. So road safety cameras are things like red light cameras, speed cameras, bus lane cameras, school bus, uh, st stop arm cameras, things like that. This is about a $340 million business. 35% margins or so, um, mid single digit recurring revenue growth out through the next five years. And again, I, I like to say, how do, you, how do you size the business? To give you an idea, there's about 11 billion vehicles that pass our cameras globally every year. And we process about 110,000 events per day. So what, one thing we, we don't like to say, is we're not the red light camera company that is a part of what we do. Um, but road safety is a big part of what we do and a big part of our safety journey. And then finally, the, the newest addition to the family, we're the number one provider of parking solutions to universities in North America. Parking solutions is hardware and software. We don't own, don't own parking lots or anything like that. About an $80 million business, high teens, low 20s um, percent margin, high single digit growth in this business organically over term. Um, 2,000 customers in, in North America, and, and again, on, uh, on scale, we process about $2.5 billion of parking commerce annually through our systems. So that's, that's Vera Mobility. I know it's a publicly traded firm. Is it? How long ago did it go public? Uh, third quarter of 2018. So we're just coming up on five years here. And one thing a lot of people don't know about that is we were actually a SPAC. Um, there were very, very few SPACs that were that were happening in uh, 2018, and there's only a handful, and uh, and we were one of those. So we went through uh, organic growth. Just a little bit of the history of the company. The the first traffic camera in, in the United States and presumably in the world was right here in Phoenix, Arizona, where the company's based, and it was installed in the early 1990s, and it was the precursor of the company that of Vera Mobility. So this grew organically um, through the founders, a couple of rounds of private equity, and finally went public in the third quarter of 2018. Do you have manufacturing production? Uh, I, I, can you give us a, a sense of how this company sure. operates? Yeah, Sure. A, a, a little bit, very little yeah. bit. Um, and I'll take it kind of business by business. On, on the commercial side of the house, if you get into a rental car and you see the slide box that says, do you want to use the easy pass or not for, for you in, in, in New York, Jack? Um, we make that um, and, and on the road cameras. We source all that. We do some assembly and we do some assembly of the equipment on the parking side. But th this is a software business. W one thing that'll put it in perspective, we talk about a three quarter of a billion dollar business. Ninety four percent of the revenue in 2022 was recurring revenue. So one thing about about this business, it is uh, software as a service, long term, long, long term um, in uh, uh, relationships with our customers. And the uh, who would be the customers then? You know, the types of customers that you have? Sure, our four largest customers make up 
a little less than half of the company. So that, I think that's a, that's a real good proxy. Yeah. Um, our large customer is New York City. Yeah. So New York City did the largest rollout of photo enforcement technology in the history of the planet. And we were the sole provider and continue to be the sole provider of that program. So uh, New York City, and then that, that's on the government solutions, photo enforcement side. We moved to the, um, to the rental car side or the commercial side, the big three, what, what are called racks or rental car companies in the United States. And, and uh, you know, are we led to believe that the, it's a similar metrics to other SaaS companies or do you look at the world a little differently? Is it all the unit economics, renewable customers, lifetime customer value? It, 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 it is. Um, I, I think the way that we tend to look at it is share of wallet growth with existing customers. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you have this ARR model, you tend to, you know, when, when I say something like 94 percent recurring revenue in 2022, a lot of that revenue when you enter into the year is with existing customers. So it goes back to how are you putting new products in front of those customers and how are you taking that model, which you've proven works really, really well in one part of the country or the world and export that as legislation allows you to. Uh, legislation as in government regulation. Is that, uh, do I have that right? You know, it, it, it is. So when you're on when you're on the government side of the house and we're talking about photo enforcement. So let me give you a prime example. If you're in Florida today, red light cameras are there, but there's no speed photo enforcement. Whereas if you go to New York City, you have both. Right. Why is that? It's because certain states allow certain things. And, and, and the trend has always been towards additional camera enforcement in those in those municipalities. And that's where we have we have 70 percent market share here. Um, and, and growing. So you can imagine that we're, we're the, the sales cycle here as a municipality decides that they want to participate. Um, and, and by the way, when we talk about photo enforcement, this is always driven by safety. So if, if you live somewhere where there's photo enforcement, the day that camera goes up, either at the intersection or the road, give it two weeks till the first tickets come out, you will see the behavior change. That's the same everywhere in the world. We do it in Australia. In England, we do it in France, and we do it in the United States, and, and it's the same. That's why it's done. And, you know, as, as a new municipality opens, we'll be there ready with a solution that's worked other places to do that. So that, that's where we focus a lot of our time. And again, we understand you just arrived, but as far as FP&A is concerned, do you have a vision for the team you'd like to, to build and build upon? Um, yeah. Uh, we're always interested how you're using your FP&A talent, whether you assign them to potential deals to acquire, companies to acquire, whether they're working on certain projects. I don't know. But tell us a little bit about your FP&A team philosophy. Sure. Sure. A lot of it has to do with capital allocation. That That's the big thing here. So when, when you have businesses that are cash generative, I want to make sure we don't fall into bad habits, right, with our cash Make sure we keep an eye on working capital, but maybe even more importantly is there's an infinite amount of things that the business wants to invest in, which is great. What I want the FP&A team to do is to be able to educate the operational and commercial leaders of the business what, it, what, what a return on capital actually looks like, right? What it means if you sell something and cannibalize something else. I want that common language to go across the business and why that's so important as the business continues to scale. I want that to be a common vernacular that everyone in the company understands. Sometimes, even, even though we, we generate quite a bit of cash, of course, we're going to have to say no. And what, what I found is it's not good to be the, the wizard behind the curtain saying yes or no as things come. You need to explain to people why. This, these 10 things are a better return for the company and, and, and are, are better for our customers and their long-term health than these 10 things. And here are the metrics that help you understand that that's the case. And those metrics don't change. So when I think about what we've done in the first year, it's really about making sure we have a common way to say, as we go to plan the future of the business, this is what success looks like. Are the government deals as attractive as commercial ones i mean you know we think of the government deals as being maybe low margin commercial deals more i mean so can you reflect a little bit on the types of customers when it comes to invest when it comes to investable dollars it more or less comes back to you know the time of return where, where we could potentially see a return and i think the other thing is the core of the business for customers that have been with us for a long time new york city's been a customer for two decades 
right? Each of the three large US racks have been a customer for over 10 years, right? I want to make sure that we're directing resources that continually drive value for those customers. So if, if, if you think about if you think about the size of the markets that we com- that we compete in and our position in those markets, we wake up every day as if we have zero share every day, right? And that that's that's how this business has been built, and that that that's how it's going to continue to be continue to be run in the future. This, how old a company is it again? Uh, it's been public for five years. The company, the predecessor to this company, was started in the early 1990s, and that was only in photo enforcement. A lot of the development going forward, I would think, is the customer facing, making this as easy for governments to adopt and deploy. And, and can we add more functionality? What do they want from us? How do we make this easy and quick? And and uh, so it's all about measuring that customer behavior interface. How am I doing? <laughs> no, you're you're doing you're doing great, Jack. All right, and, and, and I think let, let me let me uh, tell you about some of the growth factors for the company. I think yeah. maybe that'll that'll kind of slot it in. Maybe that's what you're asking before. Yeah. Is uh, you know, so let let's talk about what's going on in, in in the in the commercial space. So rental cars are rental cars. They're they're going to be, but the cars themselves are changing. Right, things are being more connected. What does that mean? What does that mean for the future of tolling? If, if we look at what some of our rental car customers have done, they've shifted a lot of the fleet to electric vehicles now, yeah. right? What does what does that mean? What does that electric vehicle do that a traditional in, in, um, internal combustion vehicle didn't do in the past? And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with modernizing our offering, but some of the stuff that we do on the outside today may reside in the car in the future. And we spend a lot of time a lot of time and quite a bit of funding to make sure we're part of that future. The electrification of the fleet and the connectivity of the fleet. We look at government solutions. I'll use an example. I, I just I moved to Arizona a year ago. I lived in, in downtown Chicago for 15 years on a very busy, very busy corner. And every morning when I came out on that corner, you would see Amazon, you would see Uber Eats, you would see the Lyft driver, and you would see the FedEx person. And there was a bunch of people who would pull on and off that curb to make their living. Now, if you're the city, that curb is a 10-minute loading zone. And it, you put up a sign, paint the curb a certain color, and you're done. How do you monetize that? That's a monetizable asset. People are now making their living on your infrastructure that they weren't before. You need to be able to do two things to be able to monetize that. The first thing is you need to have some kind of permitting infrastructure. And the second thing is you need to have an enforcement infrastructure that doesn't rely on a human being to know if only permitted people are using that infrastructure. That's called the monetization of the curb. And when I think about that between our parking business and our government solutions business, which was one of the strategies of the parking deal, that's something going forward that, that it could be a very big deal in cities. Another one. Um, that's live in Europe, but not here in the United States yet, is road usage charging. So, um, for instance, if you were to drive in certain parts of central London, you can't be there between 3 and 6 p.m. Otherwise, you, you get a ticket. It's relatively expensive. That's a great way to reduce congestion in major cities. Again, you need a big infrastructure to be able to do that. Vera Mobility has that capability. So when you look at those next vectors and what's coming next, we spend a lot of time to make sure the, the company's positioned to capitalize on that and to make sure our, our customers aren't caught flat footed. We have to ask about self-driving cars and whether you believe there's an opportunity. And I'm sure you, you believe so. But as we know, it's sure. kind of gotten pushed further into the future, at least in a lot right. of people's thinking. Can, can you share any thoughts on that and whether that's something you guys have examined closely and Yes, I, absolutely. And, and what I would say is I, I think I think you hit it even in your question, Jack. It, the 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 fully autonomous driving is decades away. I, I think, I, it, and, and that's different than I think what 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 the common lexicon was five years ago. And the reason I know that is when the company went public, we got a lot more questions about that. I can see that going through the record than we do today, just because it was more of an imminent thing. And, and he, he, here's what the shape of that question was, Jack. Right? Is in a fully autonomous world, does your government solutions business exist? Nobody runs red lights, nobody speeds, nobody, right? And that that's kind of the question. And, and, and I think the answer for that is it is so far off, 20, 30 years off, that it's not really on the planning horizon right now. But when you look at the increased functionality of the car, so let's let's back up from autonomous driving to, you know, now your car could potentially act kind of like a wallet. 
right? You may pull into the gas station and you don't have to tap your card. It's going to recognize the device in your car. Does that have an impact on tolling? There are things that people are thinking about and we are on the vanguard of all of those discussions. So autonomous 30 years out, the building blocks to autonomous are, are more in the medium term. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we do want to uh, jump to our finance strategic moment question, and this might have happened anytime during the course of your career. We're just looking for one moment of insight that you experienced that you can share with us. Reveals how finance plays a strategic role in business. What comes to mind? Yeah, the one that comes to the forefront of mind. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very good story, but it, 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 it taught me a ton. Um, this was in about 2008 to 2009, and it really had, had very little to do with the financial crisis. Um, I had moved from GE Capital to another part of the company, and within the first couple months in that role, I, I realized that we had a, a pretty material issue on the balance sheet, very material issue, on the, a large enough to have attention from headquarters and, 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 and the SEC at one point. Um, and that was a really tough time. It was an old business that had been around for 100 years. And it's one of those decisions that you need to make as a finance leader that says, do I continue doing what's been done and worked for everybody before me? Or do I go out on, on the edge here and say, this isn't right, regardless of what that could mean for, for me or my career? Now, like, like, most, like, like most crossroads, they, they look kind of obvious. Right. When 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 you're looking back 15 years, but at the time I really struggled with that. And I made the choice that I was going to raise the issue, be a very unpopular person and um, push it through. And there were some dark, dark months that that I went through there. I really thought um, it was going to be the end of my career. I, I didn't know if I'd made the right decision. Um, when you're in a situation like that, and I'll bring this back Jack, to why, how, how it influences how I behave today, I promise. But. It when 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 I when 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 I look back at that, I felt very lonely. You know that the whole thing, success has many fathers, failure is an orphan. You can certainly feel that when you have a controllership issue that's been building over 20 years. The decisions that caused that issue were made when I was in middle school, right? But at the end of the day, you can't let it go any further, and um, it ended up working out just fine. And I, I credit the, co the, the 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 culture of the company. Um, to, to do that, but it, it took a year and a half. And what that taught me was you need to put the numbers aside sometimes, put the career aside, and you need to go in and say, morally, what should I be doing here? What does my gut tell me is the right thing? And once you've had that conversation with yourself, you need to stay the course. And um, I, I think that that was the, the, the defining moment for me and how I was going to make really, really, really hard decisions, impactful decisions go forward. That was one when the answer is not super clear. And I, I think the second thing is, as I've set up control infrastructures after seeing that experience, it's really, really good. It, it, a positive from a negative is really good to say this is what can happen over term if you don't do this up front, right? So w one thing, you know, I, I, I noticed in my career, a lot of people, th there's a book out there called Good to Great, which I'm sure you've read, a lot of people have read. And, and th th there's one thing about studying success that I think will teach you one thing, but you really need to look at failure too, right? Not just looking at who did it well, where did it go bad? And what did you learn from that that you can put go forward? And every, every new role I've taken since then, not even it, between companies, any, any time I've had new folks in front of me, I've told that story. And, you know, one thing that I say is, you know, on, on my team and the culture that I'm going to be a part of that I'm going to drive is always going to reward the person who would stand up when it's difficult. OK, with the right perspective, would stand up when it's difficult. And if we fail to invest in these controllership type infrastructures over term, this is what can happen. And it's not fun. That that was that was a career defining moment for me, and it happened ten years into my career. Hello, and welcome to sixty second stories from CFO Thought Leader. It was roughly eight years ago when Heathrow Airport's veteran CFO exited the company. His departure prompted Heathrow's executive board to appoint an interim CFO. For Javier Javi, who had held a succession of senior finance and operation roles at the airport for the past seven years, the CFO office seemed finally in reach. 
Nevertheless, Hethrow's executive board passed over Ajhavi and appointed one of his professional peers, thus administering one of the more difficult career lessons of Ajhavi's finance career. You will hear that story and much more on episode number 883 of CFO Thought Leader, featuring CFO Javier Ajhavi. Remember the future of finance is listening. We want to jump to what we refer to as our mentoring round, where we'll ask you several questions intended to inspire and inform future finance leaders. We want you to think back to the first time you stepped into a CFO role. And I imagine this is at the uh, company prior to Vera, uh, Century Aluminum. Again, fairly sizable company, not, not a small company, but um, think back to your first 30 or 60 days. Again, you've had this long career in large enterprise but now you're CFO and it, all the responsibilities are on your shoulder. It's different. It's just different. And uh, maybe there was something you didn't expect. Maybe you, you were like, oh, I can manage this for sure. I, anyway, we wonder what you would tell yourself thinking about who you were back then as you first stepped into that role. And what would you tell yourself if you could go back in time? What is the piece of advice you wish you had heard or you would give yourself now thinking back to that person as you started out as a CFO? Sure. Sure. Don't be afraid about asking what, what you don't know because you don't want to look stupid. I mean, it's that I wish I could say it more eloquently than that, Jack, but that that's really the answer. And I'll give you a prime example. So co coming into that role, one of the things that was going to be on the horizon is we need to refinance our debt. Now, to a veteran CFO that has done that 50 times, that's, you know, 10 phone calls, six months and it's done. But I, I didn't have that experience. So I got on the phone with a bunch of bankers. And I heard things like Perry Passu, whisper, call, strike, uh, up 30, down 70. And, 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 and I was, wow. And in the first couple calls, and I had other folks on the call too, I decided to say, okay, take this at face value, go home, print it off, go look it up. You know, I, I have an undergraduate degree in finance. I went to grad school. I'll figure it out. It's out there on the internet somewhere. And I did that. And so some of those 30 page decks, let's say I could figure out an, an incremental 15% over and above what I can understand on the phone. It wasn't enough. And I, I wish I could go back and say, Craig, stop them and say, I don't get it. Because one thing I found is, and this is a recurring theme within finance, finance is a language, all right? I'll break down finance real quick. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, debt, equity, end of story. Oh, debt, equity, loan, lease, done, that, that's it. There's nothing else, right? And if you can take and decode that language back to those things, the, 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 the concepts are deceptively simple. And it's something that you've seen before, right? And what I found out when I started asking those questions, and I use this example because it was the first one. There's been more. Um, I never, ever got a, you're a CFO and you don't know that. You know, that never happened. It's like, oh, I always get that question. It means this. And then it's, oh, and you'll figure it out and move on. So what I would say that critical 60 or 90 days, you want to go out and you want to be that I belong here, right? You don't want to have any of that imposter syndrome. I belong here and I'll figure it out. And if not, I'll stay up till three o'clock in the morning and figure it out when you can't see me doing it. Well, you can't do that at scale. So you really need to be comfortable when you're talking to folks that are speaking a language you don't understand to make it simple for you. I will guarantee you it's not the first time they've heard it. That's what I tell myself. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. We always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side. We're wondering if you have a personal habit or part of a daily routine that you're known for over time. It might be something, you know, a family member might point out to us. That's the way he's done it. He's always done that. Don't know why. Uh, but this is, this is how Craig does it. A anything come to mind, personal habit, part of a daily routine, something you're known for? Sure. And I would say my wife would be the first one to say, I drive. I love to drive. I have my best ideas in the car. And the nice part about moving from a, a, a traffic choke city to a more wide open place like the Phoenix Mesa era, area is there are wide roads that go a long way. So I, I, like to, I like to have a bit of a commute between my home and the office. I like to think. I come into the office every day, even though we're kind of on a hybrid schedule, which is working great, by the way. Um, but I like to have that for some stuff passing by the window. 
I used to do it on the train in Chicago and on, on the car it helps me think and it helps me strip away all the other things that are going on. And I can't tell you how many times I've pulled over or come home and sent an email to myself or a note to myself. And it's not a stressful thing at all. It just allows it it'll, for me personally, it allows the noise to filter out. And that's where I have some of my, I think, best ideas. Yeah, great, great, great example. Thank you for that. Um, wonder if you, there is a book that might have influenced you along the way. Maybe it's a book you escape with. Any, anything uh, come to mind? We've asked for a book. It doesn't have to be a business book. Again. You know. Yeah, I, I've got two. And one one is kind of a business book and one is definitely a business book. The business book that comes to mind is uh, The Outsiders. And, and what, what, what I love about that book is it talks about the importance of capital allocation, right? And it takes such diverse examples and says, you know, forget the conventional wisdom for a second. Look over the long term. Here's what folks in very different industries have been able to do. And I think it's fascinating. I say it's by William Thorndike. And again, the outsiders, eight unconventional CEOs and their radically rational blueprint for success. That one has more of a business slant. The one that I think is has kind of a business slant, but it's more pop culture. And it's the one I've read five times is Freakonomics. Yeah. I absolutely love that book. The reason why I love that book is I, I think, you know, some people would say, uh, you know, Sun Tzu or something like that is a strategy book. I think Freakonomics is of that ilk of a strategy book. It teaches you to think about things a little bit differently, right? So one concept that I, I like to explore, cognitive biases and causational inference, right? So when, when you look at something and say, for instance, every day I wear a blue shirt, it's sunny outside. So does the act of me putting on a blue shirt make it sunny outside? Now, you know that's not true. But you could look at the data and maybe it's and what Freakonomics or what, uh, what what the author, I think, does an uh, incredible job of doing is saying, look a level deeper. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in operating reviews where you see the trend and you're like, well, I know what's going on. No, you don't. No, you, you might not, right? And, and I think looking at – Looking at the way someone else solves problems helps you make sure you've asked yourself that second question. Also, as a leader, that's your job. If you're out, in my opinion, if you're out analyzing your team, you you don't have a team that's fit for purpose. You're not doing it right. What you want to be able to do is say, did you think about this that way? That helps develop the team. It helps the company get a more robust answer, and it helps people grow. So freaking out. <laughs> great, great selection for us. Thank you for that. We're up to our final question where we'll ask you to look forward finally for us. And uh, we're wondering what your priorities then as CFO of Vera Mobility over the next 12 months might be. What are those priorities as CFO? Sure. So um, what, one, of the, one of the first things I did, my, when, I think my 85th day in the company, we did the first investor day in the history of the company. So the CEO, the rest of the ELT and I were at the NASDAQ on stage um, and we laid out what the next five years of the company were, are, are, are going to look like. And we've refined that, execute to that plan, period, execute to that plan. I think that's, that's, that, that's number one far and away. The second thing is, is we've done a bit of a reorganization at the company. So when you have a founder-led company that grows to a bigger organization, I've seen this at scale at GE and ITW, uh, you, you tend to have a very centralized kind of network. But as the, as the company gets bigger and more diverse, it's very difficult for that centralized nerve system to be close to the customer. So what we've done is we're moving the company to a portfolio model. And we're, a lot of that is being driven by shared services. So instead of having a large corporate team that does everything for the business and, and bills on their behalf, we're disseminating that team into the businesses. And I'll make it this simple. This is the way I, I've kind of started this process and the way I'm running it is if it touches a customer, it belongs in the business. Huh. Okay. If it's only touching an investor or, you know, a, a, or someone who gives or, or gives or extracts money from the company financially, then it should reside in corporate. And when I look at, big companies at scale, right? Danaher, Ford, and some of the companies that I mentioned before, that's how they run. That's a, a model that I think is, is, is a good model for developing talent. And uh, that, that, that's one we're going to implement here and we're in the process of doing it there. Craig Conti, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate it. It was great. Hello, 
Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page. And you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.